Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining today's live technical topic webinar. Um, I hope everyone is well. Uh, my name is Riley and I assist in coordinating all of EIT's various free webinars that we hold. Um, if you'd like to view any of our upcoming or past webinars, you can go to our events page um, on our website. Uh, now, before we get started, um, I'd just like to let you know um, there are some notifications and sounds that pop up during Blackboard sessions. Um, so before, uh, before we start the webinar, um, if I could ask you to please just disable your um, sound or pop-up notifications, you can do that by going to the um, cog symbol or your settings. Um, it should be in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you're on mobile, you might need to open the session menu um, and just untick all of the uh, boxes under notification settings. And that will disable all the sounds and pop-ups um, during the session. And today's topic um, is, uh, is going to be about ArcFlash. Uh, what is it and uh, how, how do we design for it? Um, now, it is being presented by one of our lecturers here at EIT, um, Alexandra Gregory, and she's also a senior um, electrical engineer um, working full time. So uh, moving on, um, I'd just like to run over uh, some common questions that we get about these webinars. And um, firstly, the slides and the video recording. So you will receive um, a copy of the PDF slides and a link to the video recording um, within the next two business days via email. Um, uh, so that's to everyone that's registered uh, for the webinars and uh, a certificate of attendance. So for these ones, we do provide um, a free digital certificate of attendance. Um, so I will be providing a link at the end of the session, which goes to a, a short form of survey um, in which you'll need to complete um, in order to receive one. Um, I'd just like to note, we like to keep these webinars as interactive as possible. So um, please use the, um, the chat box if you have any questions or thoughts you'd like to share during the session. Um, and I'll be active um, in the chat box for most of the webinar. Um, so I can answer any non-academic questions uh, for you. And uh, just to give you a brief overview of EIT. So we are a engineering um, specific education provider. Um, so we only, uh, we only provide courses in engineering. We have um, short non-accredited courses. Um, we have uh, VET qualifications. Um, such as advanced diplomas. And we have uh, a range of courses in the higher education sector uh, from bachelor's and master's degrees to a doctorate of, uh, a doctor of engineering. Um, and we have industry oriented programs. Um, so by that, I mean, uh, we have programs that are updated regularly and are in line with, uh, with industry. We have Sorry, Alex. Um, did I just lose my sound there? <laughs> that may have been me. I apologize. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Good. Um, and yeah, uh, just to and just to finish off. So um, we do have uh, courses that are internationally recognised, um, not only just uh, accredited by the Australian government. Um, so you can have a look at that um, on our website. And uh, we have industry experience lecturers, like I mentioned. So we have, uh, we have lecturers that are working um, in industry, like Alexandra. Um, so that provides you with a, a, a quality engineering learning experience um, as they're able to connect theory um, to the real world. Um, and we have unique delivery model, um, which includes uh, dedicated learning support, um, state-of-the-art technologies such as hands-on workshops, remote labs, and simulation software. So 
Um, I will now hand over to Alex, um, who is, yeah, as I, as I mentioned, um, a lecturer with us at EIT and, um, and working in the electrical industry. Um, so it's great to have you here today, Alex. Um, thank you very much. No worries. Happy to be here. Um, so, as Riley said, uh, I'm a senior electrical engineer over in Brisbane. Um, I've been working in the field as a designer for about six or seven years now, after a couple of years in construction. Uh, and so I sort of picked this topic because it's something that I hadn't heard about uh, five or six years ago when I started. And it's certainly something that is becoming a lot more prevalent uh, in certainly my industry and also um, across the board. Uh, so, you know, you're talking buildings and mining. Um, so hopefully you get something out of it that you didn't know uh, and we will kick off. All right, so arc flash. Um, we're going to go through a lot of buzzwords today uh, on this topic because it certainly can cause a lot of confusion. Um, but in general terms, arc flash is typically associated with electrical work uh, and it's often considered a specialist topic, uh, which I'm hoping to uh, demyth for everyone today. Um, it's been around forever, arc flash events such as this picture uh, on the slide here. Uh, where we have switchboard explosions have occurred since we've had electricity, um, but it's just becoming a lot more uh, important at the moment um, in the industry from a design perspective and also from a uh, facility owner and operator perspective. And our knowledge as a result of the risks associated with arc flash, so what causes it, what can go wrong when it happens, uh, is still evolving. So I think it's quite important for anyone who deals with electricity uh, in their job um, to understand really what arc flash is, uh, how we can mitigate it, whether, again, you're a designer, you're a facility owner, or even someone who has come through and done your trade, because uh, at the end of the day, we're trying to just keep people safe. So your consequences of arc flash can range. Uh, obviously, you can have severe burns and death for workers. Uh, for workers. But you've also got the impacts relating to power outages, fires that are caused, and just general property damage. Um, one of the things that makes this topic so ambiguous is the number of different standards that are around relating to arc flash and arc flash studies, uh, the terminology that's used. So you would hear flash, fault, uh, fault blast, event, hazard, um, and these vary interstate across Australia even, and certainly uh, between organisations and overseas. Uh, and all in all, it makes this topic of art flash quite ambiguous in general. So the purpose of today is to hopefully, in the first instance, give you an understanding of what art flash is. Uh, so when we say there has been an art flash, what does that actually look like? We'll then touch on the causes of arc flash events, um, obviously geared more towards design because that's my industry, uh, and also the consequences of when they do occur. And lastly, we'll have a look at responsibilities of designers, so people such as myself or those who may be studying anything along the lines of electrical engineering, um, what we have to do and also what we can do to mitigate the risk of arc flash in our designs, whether they're switchboard designs or similar. And lastly, we'll just have some time for, for Q&A at the end, because I'm sure there'll be many questions. So our first question, what is the difference between arc flash and arc faults? So an arc fault is what occurs when you've got current flowing through an air between phase conductors. And that might be phase to phase, or that might be phase to ground, or it might be neutral to ground. So that's the fault that's occurring. Uh, so put simply, an arc fault is when you have something that is unexpected, it is often violent, and it's essentially an electrical short circuit in the air. Uh, and it produces that arc, which is where it gets its name from. Uh, and there's a products associated or byproducts associated with an arc, but that in essence is the fault. 
the flash comes from our earlier understanding that when people suffered burns as a result of an arc fault, they looked very similar to those um, flash burns from welding arcs, because in essence, uh, they are very similar. So when we're talking about the heat that's transferred to an individual who is burnt in an arc flash, we're talking about the radiant heat and light that's caused by that arc. And that's where we get the phrase flash. So in summary, flash is just the light and heat part of an arc fault, whilst your arc fault is the event. Okay, so specifically an arc flash, what does it involve? So let's break it down. The arc is what occurs when a gas that's between two conductors, which is typically air or in a switch gear mechanism, it might be um, a different type of insulating gas. When that gas breaks down, it becomes ionised due to that potential voltage between your phases. When the gas becomes ionised, then it can now become a conductor and you have current flowing from phase to phase. And that's your arc. So the size of that arc between your two conductors is determined by how much power you've got available to sustain that arc and what the resistance is between those conductors. So essentially, what is that gas composition and how far apart are the conductors? So think of your um, air as your resistance. Now that arc, once it's triggered, will sustain itself until it's either quenched, it's suppressed or it's extinguished. And the reason that it gets the name arc is because uh, when the electrical current is flowing through the air, it causes that air to rise and it gets that D shape that um, you often see in the photos of, of arc flash events. And that's the arc shape of the current in the air. So a common question, is an arc flash the same as what occurs during welding? Uh, the answer is yes. It, the concept of an arc is still the same when you're talking about arc welding. Um, the difference is your level of control. So when you are welding or cutting using uh, arc welders, it's a controlled arc. So you're intentionally ionizing that air gap between two conductors. It's still got the same risks to people and property um, as an arc flash event. However, what we're talking about is arc faults. Arc faults are what are traditionally uncontrolled and they're unplanned. All right, so a little bit on the frequency of arc flash events. The long and the short of it is there is not a lot of consistent statistics out there specific to Australia that document arc flash events or arc fault events. Often you see US statistics uh, and they have been pushing for this a lot uh, sooner than we have. Um, and so that often leads people to think that it's more prevalent in the US, uh, which it's not. We still have many arc fault events in Australia. Um, so I pulled out a couple of stats here just to give you an idea. Um, so in 2018, Work Cover Queensland, obviously relevant to me being a Queenslander, uh, reported that from 2013, there had been 32 incidents involving arc flash, of which 20 resulted in injuries requiring hospital hospitalisation. So we're talking about serious injuries to workers. The other challenge of looking at these statistics is often the lesser incidents go unnoticed or they're not reported uh, or they just come across as burns and there's no correlation to look at uh, how people are injured and identify it correctly as an arc fault event. As frequent as January this year, so 2021, um, there were even two workers in Queensland who suffered burns working on an LV switchboard that was reported by WorkSafe Queensland. Um, so I remember when, when that one occurred only, only nine months ago. So let's look at some of the causes of arc faults. A lot of these relate primarily to electrical equipment being switchboards, switch gear. That's where most of these um, 
events occur and that's certainly where we'll be focusing today. So things like condensation in a switchboard uh, or humidity in your switch gear can cause a short. You might have pollution from foreign debris, uh, sorry, foreign deposits. So dust that sits on the bus bars in your switchboard or on top of the switch gear that might get knocked. You might have salt if you're talking uh, marine grade switchboards. Um, you could have wildlife and their residues. So we're talking rats and snakes and things that we get a lot of in Australia. Transient over voltages, either from storms or from switching surges can be a cause of arc faults. The biggest one and the most common one is aging of insulation. So this could be the wrapping of bus bars, it could be um, the housing of switch gear, it could be your termination points um, of your projective devices. And that insulation might be aging just because it's old. It could be because you have a device that's under a lot of thermal stress or is frequently used, um, meaning it's tripping. So any of those can cause degradation in insulation, which gives you the potential for an arc fault. Further causes, uh, you might just have switch gear that fails uh, as it happens. You might have loose or slack connections, uh, which gives you defective contact points. You might just have uh, the switchboard being open with people performing live work on the switchboard itself or the most basic, you might have a dropped tool. So to give you, let's see if I can use a pen. Uh, to give you an idea, um, just on the right here is an example of a dropped screwdriver, which is shorting across two phases. So immediately there you've got a phase to phase short. And then what happens is that tool will be repelled by the magnetic force of that fault, but you're still left with that potential difference that can cause ionization of the air and your arc would then um, be established and travel down your bus bar. And that's when you have switchboard explosions. Or it could be something as simple as a loose screw. Uh, so in the second picture here, we've got a loose bolt that's come into contact with the back of the switchboard and the bus bar. So then you've got a phase to a ground fault similar sort of situation. It's still an arc fault that's still going to travel through your switchboard uh, and then we'll have the impacts of that which we're about to go into. So, the, oh, and just briefly on um, these causes, it's important to point out that there's three types of causes here that are all sort of jumbled on these slides. Uh, it might be something resulting from human error, i.e. a dropped tool. Um, it could be something resulting from poor maintenance, which is where you've got dust buildup, you've got um, uh, snakes and... Or sometimes you just have... Cat you just have catastrophic failure of your switch gear. So there is three different categories. All right. What is the result of an arc fault? So first and foremost, we have this plasma cloud. So what I'm talking about here is when an arc fault occurs and that flash, which is the heat and light forms, you have an instantaneous conversion of your conductors, so your copper typically, or your aluminium from a solid to a gas. And that is the ionized plasma. That causes superheating of the air and then we have a rapid increasing pressure as a result of that superheating. So if we look at this picture here, let's see if I can scroll. Yeah, cool. Um, so this is our example of a dropped tool across three phases that will then get pushed away, but you've got the resultant arc traveling in this direction. So 20,000 degrees is the temperature of an arc or a typical arc. So we're talking very high temperatures. Because of that, you've got rapid expansion of air that causes a pressure or a shock wave. A pressure and shock wave produces deafening sound. You've got that blast of hot gas and that plasma, which is dust or smoke or molten droplets of copper. Uh, so copper actually expands at 44,000 times its size when 
it turns into plasma, producing that blast. So it's quite a big event. Um, so we've touched on it, but we've got blinding light, we've got the deafening noise, we've got the pressure wave, we've got this ejection of molten metal. And depending on what was in the switchboard, uh, you could have smoke that is toxic. So as things combust, um, a lot of things produce toxic smoke. So when we're talking about the pressure waves, something important to remember is these arc faults often occur in something that is enclosed. So it might be a switch gear component, like a circuit breaker or an isolator or a changeover switch, what have you, uh, or more commonly, a switchboard. So in both of those situations, you've got this pressure wave and this rapid expansion of hot air occurring in an enclosed device, which is why we often see that explosion of the front cover of switchboards blowing open. Taking it a step further, if you have a switchboard in a cupboard or in a plant room, you've still got, although it's bigger, an enclosed space. So that pressure wave is often um, forgotten when we're talking about arc fault explosions that will throw people or debris um, around the place. Next slide. Okay, so looking at this image, which I hope you can see, um, Stating here that the time to an arc flash, we're talking uh, milliseconds. So in this particular brochure, we're talking five milliseconds is the typical time when an arc flash occurs from the fault to the flash. So it's very, very quick. In this picture, to give you a visual understanding for the visual learners, um, you've got a worker working in switchboard. The switchboard is obviously live, the panel is open, and we have an arc fault. So we've got that intense light. We've got the sound waves that are greater than 140 decibels. Um, we've got pressure waves. We've got uh, our metal vapor because metal is being vaporized. We've got shrapnel and we've got molten metal droplets all blasting out of that switchboard to someone who is standing in front of it. Now, recent studies comparative or in comparison to uh, before I started designing, so let's say six years, um, would focus on the fault itself. Um, but what we found is the major hazard to persons associated with arc flash events is actually the plasma that's ejected from the arc as opposed to the electricity itself. So next. All right. Consequences. Three main consequences. Obviously, your asset is damaged. It might be minor, it might be catastrophic. Um, that's going to cost money to repair. You're going to have downtime associated with your investigation, associated with seeing if you can repair it or replace it, getting components. So all of that equates to um, a business no longer operating. You also have most importantly, your potential for injury, maiming or death of operators and also other bystanders. So other people in the room who might be on the receiving end of, of flying shrapnel or debris as a result of something such as this. All right, so we touched on just before this five milliseconds. To give you some context, I was reading on some studies about human reaction time. Um, and what they said is the human reaction time to actually sense, judge and run away from something such as this is 0.4 of a second. So we're talking 400 milliseconds. With an arc flash being something that occurs in five, then you can see that there is no opportunity for someone to escape this. So if you are a worker, or near a switchboard where there is an arc fault, uh, you will still be standing in that same position when that fault occurs. No one has the reaction time to move away, to shelter themselves. Um, so that is going to be left up to us in terms of design or personal protective gear, which we'll, we'll touch on. So to now take what happens in an arc flash and look at the impact of that on a person, 
let's talk it through. Plasma burns to people, number one, typically on the hands because people tend to have that as the closest part of their body to the switchboard itself. Um, it also can ignite your clothing. So, you know, your standard cotton high vis shirt uh, can actually be a bad thing to be wearing um, because it is very easy to ignite and it is not in any way fire retardant. You've got the light causing blindness and eye damage. You've got the noise. Uh, so this 140 decibels, we're talking an art flash event can actually exceed that of a jet engine and damage your hearing. So if anyone works or has been out at airports or uh, Royal Air Force bases and heard a jet engine, um, you'll know what we're talking about. The gas and fumes produced uh, may be toxic and quite commonly are because you've got um, insulation that has melted, um, plastics, things like that producing toxic smoke. And lastly, this concept of blast. So that can cause debris to fly. Um, not only will that door swing open, other compartments might swing open, bits and pieces fly out, it might throw people, which happens. Uh, so the blast is not to be disregarded. So pop quiz with the answers already on the slides. Uh, what would be worse, a high voltage or a low voltage arc flash? And we often get this question um, in the workplace for me, uh, being a low voltage engineer versus the high voltage engineer. The low voltage is actually more dangerous. Um, and this particular paper pointed out that we're talking up to seven times more dangerous to personnel than high voltage. And there's a few reasons for that. When you're talking a higher voltage, you're talking a lower impedance, typically. Um, Kirchhoff's, I mean, vehicle's IR concept. You've also got, when you're looking at your protective devices, uh, a faster clearing time, meaning when there is a fault, high voltage protective devices often kick in a lot sooner than low voltage. And lastly, sorry to translate that, meaning if your fault is cleared a lot more quickly, that arc hasn't been sustained as long, so the time is less, so it hasn't got as much energy as one that had been persisting for longer. And just lastly, uh, you also often have higher working distances between your conductors. So what I mean by that is, this is a transformer. On the HV side, your, your distances between conductors here are typically greater than your distances between your phases in an LV installation. So because your distance is greater, your arc length through that air is greater, so your resistance is higher. So overall, again, that um, the energy level of that arc is less. Uh, and vice versa for low voltage. So higher impedance, meaning a slower clearing time. Our phases are closer together. So we've got a smaller resistance for that arc to travel in higher energy. There's also less procedures around low voltage works than there are high voltage works typically. Um, and although it's difficult to quantify, there is the belief that uh, workers are a lot more complacent when it comes to working on low voltage switchboards and switch gear than they are high voltage. Uh, so the combination of those things mean at the end of the day, LV arc faults are considered a lot more dangerous than HV arc faults. All right, so moving on to design and responsibilities. So to kick off, I just wanted to touch on standards. Now, I know when I started having a dig into this topic, uh, it was quite confusing as to what the standards were, because typically there's direct Australian standards that are mandated in legislation um, as to what it is you're designing. So you know, if we're talking AS3000, or if you're looking at switchboards, we're talking about AS61439. Um, but for ArcFlash, there is no specific standard relating to arc flash that is legislated. What it does come down to though, and what is being pushed um, 
through the industry is at the end of the day, as a designer, you have a duty of care. And this duty of care for Queensland, and it's going to be similar interstate and across the nation in for you guys over in WA, is the Workplace Health and Safety Act. For us, it states that a person conducting a business or an undertaking must ensure as far as reasonably practical that the health and safety of workers and others at the workplace as far as reasonably practical. I might have a bit missing from that sentence. Essentially, it is our duty to make sure people are safe and to demonstrate that we have thought about that and made all attempts to ensure that they are safe, whether they are the maintenance guys, the guys installing it, or the guys building it. Yes, okay, so we'll keep going on standards. The common standards are NFPA 70E, which is the North American version of our AS3000, and IEEE 1584, named the Guide for Performing Arc Flash Hazard Calculations. So again, neither of these standards are legislated in Australia, um, but they have inadvertently uh, become the de facto Arc Flash standards, meaning this is what we use. Uh, I've attended a couple of conferences on this topic, um, and even a lot of softwares that we use are beginning to be updated to fold in Arc Flash hazard assessments, and they are based on both of these two standards. So in the absence of an actual Australian standard, uh, this is what currently um, we are using. So why is that too? 1584, as the name suggests, this is the standard that is used to perform your arc flash hazard calculation. So what that is, is um, the standard that says how to calculate the amount of energy in an arc flash based on your switchboard or your LVHV distribution design. And it allows you to work out how much energy could occur in an arc flash event and then determine an arc flash boundary, which we'll define in a second. Uh, secondly, for NFPA, this is uh, within that standard, they um, set out PPE requirements, so personal protective equipment. So your hats, your face shields, your gloves, your um, et cetera. So what it does is it says for certain levels of incident energy, we would use these categories of PPE which we'll go through. But that's sort of how the two go in tandem. And again, this is in relation to what uh, I use in my design as a electrical design engineer. Um, there are other standards, there are other processes, but typically these are the two most common. So very brief overview of how to perform arc flash calculations. We're not going to be doing any examples today or going through it in detail, um, but just want to give you an overview of IEEE 1584 and what the steps would be. So your first step is typically to work out what your voltage range is because it can be applied to low voltage and high voltage. Using that, you determine your arcing current and into that calculation is fed the size of your power supply, so what size transformer do you have as an example, or what is the amperage of your switchboard, how big are your bus bars, um, how far apart are they, all of those factors go into these formula and you determine your arcing current. Then you look at your arc duration. About before how an arc will sustain itself until it's extinguished. Um, so what we're talking about here is, in a switchboard design as an example, you determine your arcing current and then you look at that fault current and you look at the tripping curve of your protective device upstream, so your circuit breaker or your fuse, and then you work out when that tripping device will trip and cut off power downstream, meaning you have an arc event, protective device trips in X amount of time and the duration uh, until that happens is your arcing duration. When you know the value of your current, so how big an arc you could get and for how long it would be sustained for, you can use those two things to determine your incident energy. So how much energy you might have at a particular um, distance. 
based on your arcing current. And that's what this arc flash boundary is. So your arc flash boundary, um, just lost the copy. Anyway, arc flash boundary is at set distances, what the incident energy is on a surface at those distances. And in this case, when we're saying a surface, we're talking about a human typically, so a person. So what is um, the incident energy at a metre or vice versa, if I'm standing a metre away, what is the incident energy at that distance? Okay, so arc flash incident energy. So by definition, it's talking about the thermal energy on a surface, which again is a person, uh, that they are exposed to at a set distance when an arc occurs. Often this is called the working distance and it's a calories per centimetre squared unit. Your boundary, this is what is known as an approach limit or the distance at which a person would be expected to receive a curable burn on exposed skin. What that means is IEEE 1584 says your arc flash boundary or your safe working distance or your safe boundary, all similar terms for the same thing, is defined at the distance in which that incident energy is reduced to 1.2 calories per centimetre squared. So that's the definition of an arc flash boundary. What does that mean, 1.2 calories per centimetre squared? If you were to take your hand and hold it an inch above a flame for one second, a blue flame, that's one calorie per centimetre squared. Now this slide is probably the most shocking thing that I learnt when starting down the path of arc flash studies and um, design. And that's 1.2 calories per centimetre squared, which is the safe working boundary, is a second degree burn. It is what is defined as a fully recoverable or a fully survivable uh, injury. So it's considered only second degree burns. Now that's still an, a significant injury. That's not a safe working boundary where you can be X distance away, you will be um, exposed to 1.2 calories per centimetre squared of incident energy in the event of an arc flash, and you will still get second degree burns. So the big question that's circling around a lot is, although that is satisfying IEEE 1584, is that satisfying our duty of care as a designer? Are we willing to accept that we can design something knowing that will be the impact to a person if an event was to occur? And that's the big question. So over right here, just before I dig on on this picture, just shows the definition of a second degree burn. So this is your candle, um, and then this is the layers of your skin. So we're down to, um, oh, I can't even read my own slide. Down to epidermis, here we go. So you're talking blistering and uh, ulcers. Not nice, in summary. All right, five minutes, conscious of time. So we've done our calculations as designers, we've worked out our incident energy, we've worked out boundaries, what now? Now we take those values, we apply them to NFPA for PPE requirements, and we work out at what different distances certain PPE is required. So there's four categories of PPE stipulated by the NFP. Um, each one of these has a ARC rating. So what that means is if your incident energy is four calories per centimetre squared or less, it would be categorised as a PP1 area within that radius. If it was eight, it would be a PP2. If it was 25, it would be PP3. If it was greater uh, than 40, we're talking full bomb suit. There is a category zero, zero just means you don't need anything. Um, so the standard is quite clear on what those calories are, what the thresholds are determining each of these categories. So in essence, for your particular switchboard, you would go, all right, at what distance 
is my four calorie per centimetre squared limit reached? At what distance is my eight, my 25? And then you can draw those out or put them on labels, which we'll touch on briefly. So. Hey, Alex, so just, just jump yeah. in for a sec. Um, we, we're all good for time. So, you know, if, if you need to take um, some more time, you know, we've, we've, we've got till around four o'clock. So no, uh, no issues there. Okay. Cool. Uh, so this picture here shows that in practice. So up, oh, you can't see my mouse. Um, just up here is our category 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, and what that means is in this calculation, which is just an example calculation, when you have a switchboard open and live, two very important things. You, you cannot have an art fault if your switchboard is not energised. So if you have an energised switchboard that is open, this example says that the category four or PPE category four has a radius of 1.07 metres. So if you are someone who is within that 1.07 metre space here, you need to be dressed like this. Now let's skip three, but just to give you the example, category two is 3.43 metres. So if you just happen to be walking past someone doing switchboard work within that radius, you should be wearing PPE to category two. If you were outside of that, so this guy standing over here next to a closed switchboard, category zero. So you don't need to wear anything in particular. So this is one way to look at it. In practice, that might be over here, you've got three people working on the switchboard. If they're all within that 1.07 meters, then they should all be in category four PPE, which is not something that you see very often. Uh, vice versa, you've got your different categories out here. So, you know, as a cleaner, um, as long as he, if he sees someone working on a switchboard, then it might be that he needs to stay clearer than what he would have otherwise thought. So that's just that in practice. All right, the final thing that we can do once we've done this hazardous area assessment and determined our incident energies and our boundaries is to put that on the switchboards, put that on the cabinets, put that on the equipment itself so that it's all well and good having done it during design, but it needs to be there so that when people are in these plant rooms or working on equipment, they know um, what they need to be wearing or what they need to be mindful of. Again, none of this is mandated. None of this is legislated. Uh, we don't need to provide these labels, but it is becoming something definitely in the last 12 to 24 months in my industry that um, we're being asked to do more and more. And Again, relating that back to our duty of care, it's a very important thing, I think, to do. So what we put on these labels is things like the equipment name, what the voltage level is, what activities are to be performed, and most importantly, what is our art clash boundaries and what level of PPE is required. So you can see that over here we've got voltage. With a door open, the incident energy is 12.4. Uh, so if you want to be in there, you need category uh, three PPE within 1.9 meters. Now there's no set layout of what these labels look like because it's no standard. And again, they're not mandated. So you might see if you're ever in the industry, um, all sorts of labels on all sorts of gear. It's also important to note that that art flash assessment needs to be redone regularly. Uh, if there's been no change to equipment, it's typically a rule of thumb of five years that that's reassessed. Otherwise, the moment you add equipment or change equipment or upsize or do any of those things, that assessment should be redone, meaning this labeling would need to be updated. So it becomes a maintenance um, activity as well. Now, just lastly, I just want to touch on some other mitigation strategies. So. First and, foremost, first and foremost, if you're not working on a live switchboard, you do not, you're not at risk of ARC faults. Simple as that. So avoiding doing live work is the best way to eliminate the risk of an ARC fault. Now, 
our national work health and safety regulations actually prohibit work on energised equipment. So it shouldn't be happening unless there is certain and specific circumstances in which it has to, in which case you've got your systems and processes to work around that. But at the end of the day, that can be avoided. That is the best mitigation strategy. Uh, secondly, you can do an outflash study, which is the term often given to this process of doing calculations, producing labels, looking at what the impacts would be. Uh, this will inform workers of the risks once the design is done, um, and we can put those labels on switchboards to give PPE requirements. There are some other um, strategies that, again, are becoming more frequent uh, to do with switchboards specifically. The first one is selecting art fault contained switchboards. So at a high level, what that means is you can get switchboards built so that they will contain an arc fault, meaning an arc fault event can occur and that switchboard will not, uh, the door will not open. And if a person standing a set distance away, uh, wearing no PPE whatsoever, will be fine. So the switchboard contains the fault as opposed to allowing that pressure wave and that superheated gas to explode and blast out. Those boards are obviously much more onerous to design and to build and to purchase. So they are an extra cost, but they are an option. The second thing that's coming around, certainly in the last year or two, is a lot more advancements in art fault detection. So these are things that sense rapid rises in heat or in light or in pressure within a switchboard. So little sensors that are put throughout that will trip a lot sooner than a projected device will. So uh, a lot of little um, photo sensors to say, hey, I've seen that flash, I think something's about to kick off and it immediately has relays upstream to your projective devices to cut power. So it's, by doing that, it's essentially stopping the fault or really, really reducing the amount of energy in that fault. Uh, and again, becoming much more prevalent in our switchboard designs. So in summary, we made it. Um, art flash. Fault, blast, similar terms. Hopefully that's a little bit more clear in your mind what each of those are. But in essence, it's where you've got that uncontrolled event with live electrical work. It has serious consequences to personnel, to equipment. Um, and it's up to us as designers or workers or facility owners to mitigate that risk, whether it's at the design stage through those um, art fault detection devices or contain switchboards or whether it's administrative controls and we're talking about doing an art flash assessment after it's installed, putting those labels on, making sure people are wearing PPE. Secondly, um, studies are becoming a lot more of the new norm um, and this concept of 1.2 calories per centimetre, it should be squared, um, is unlikely to be acceptable by a standard in the future. So it's Although it's something that we can do now, um, it's questionable whether that's meeting our duty of care and at the end of the day, we want people to be safe. So watch this space on the topic of art flash, faults and blasts, because um, I think there'll be a lot of changes to standards and to Australian regulations uh, moving forward. And I think it's time for questions, some references. Thanks, Alex. We really appreciate that. It was a great presentation. Um, before we go to our Q&A session, um, I'd just want to let everyone know we are holding a upcoming student webinar. This is not a technical topic webinar, um, but if you'd like to hear from a couple of our uh, learning support officers um, and a couple of our um, recent graduates, uh, one of our advanced uh, diploma program, as well as uh, one of our master's degrees. Um, you can definitely register for that one um, if you're interested. Uh, so you can just uh, you can just go to our website. Um, I'll pop the link in the chat box if anyone's interested um, and you can register for that. Um, so that will be being that will be held next week um, at the same time as this webinar. Okay, and then uh, so for upcoming related EIT courses, if you're interested in studying with us in the future, um, I've just put a few uh, a few of our courses in electrical engineering um, on the slide there. 
Uh, so we have a couple of professional certificate courses, which are just short three month non-accredited courses that are starting um, at the start of next month, if you're interested. Um, and then we have a range of uh, graduate certificates, master's degrees. Um, we have advanced diplomas, even a doctor of engineering and uh, also our bachelors. Um, so most of those um, are in January and February next year. Um, and you can also look at our schedule um, and I'll post the schedule in the chat box as well. Um, so the schedule shows you all of our upcoming courses um, organized by date. Now, um, as mentioned, uh, we do provide a certificate of attendance uh, for this uh, for these technical topic webinars. Um, so if you would like to receive one, um, please uh, scan the QR code on the screen um, or alternatively uh, click this link that I'm um, posting in the chat box and that will take you to our um, short uh, form or survey um, in order to receive uh, your certificate of attendance. Um, and they will be sent out to you uh, in the next one to two business days. Um, so just uh, keep, yeah, have a look out for that one and um, yeah, check your junk email folder as well. Um, to roll, you can uh, you can reach me um, at the webinars email address. So I'll just put it in the chat box for you. Um, so yeah, please uh, please request a certificate of attendance um, if you would like one. Um, Moving on, um, so before we finish up for today, um, we'll hold a Q&A session. So um, I've, I've noticed there's been quite a few um, questions that have come through uh, throughout the webinar, Alex. Um, there's, yeah, quite a few um, technical questions. Um, so if anyone does have any um, technical questions for Alex, now is the time. Um, if you have to go, um, that's okay. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, but otherwise, uh, we'll just um, respond to some questions in the chat box. Okay. Um, so, um, there's a question from Scott. Um, does the arc flash apply to uh, to DIN rail mounted equipment not connected to bus bars? Uh, it would, you would just have less energy, I expect, when you're talking about DIN rail kit. Um, so if it's still sort of uh, single phase 230 volt stuff, um, then yes, you would. Uh, it tends to be though, uh, if you look at a switchboard, um, an LV switchboard, you tend to do your arc flash assessment for the most onerous situation. So where is your biggest bus bar? Where is your um, largest fault to occur? You do the assessment on that and then that's the single category. Otherwise you'd end up with a billion labels over everything. Um, so I personally haven't looked at a DIN rail um, calculation because uh, I'd be looking at the, the incomers, but you can get a short across anything. Thanks, Alex. Um, there's a, uh, a fairly long question here. Um, uh, Kirill has asked about some of the um, the calculations that you are doing. Um, so she said in uh, slide 23, um, you mentioned about overall steps to perform the arc flash assessment, uh, but nothing had been mentioned about conductor gaps, enclosure size, electrode configurations, and calculating minimum arcing current. Um, would you be considering these factors when uh, you are performing an arc flash assessment? Uh, absolutely. So that sort of flow chart is a very high level um, overview of how to do them. The IEEE 1584 new version, which was 2018, um, it steps you through step by step, all of which you've listed there. So you look at your conductor gaps, your enclosure size, what the configuration is, uh, you know, is it vertical, is it horizontal, what's the spacing, and all of that feeds into calculating your arcing current. Um, so yeah, so in answer to that, yes. 
Um, and yeah, I just noted your comment on category zero for NFPA. My slide's probably a little bit out of date. Um, but yeah, you're, you're also correct with that. But if, you, if you're wanting to have a look at how to do the art flash, some standards can be very convoluted. The IEEE, IEEE 1584 is not. It's a very good logical standard to have a read through and see how the calculations are done. Um, and I also saw a couple of questions, which I'll just tack on there. Is there software available? I really want this software too. There's beginning to be, so SKM tools um, and ETAP uh, do have Art Flash capabilities in them. I haven't investigated them too much. Um, you just need to make sure that they're using the latest 1584, which came out in 2018. Um, but yeah, again, there's not a set uh, software that everyone is using, but they are beginning to catch up. Cool, thanks, Alex. Um, Peter has asked um, if the switchboard is sold um, arc and or arc proof. This is only presumably true if all the doors are closed. Um, would an arc flash study still be advisable to carry out? Yes, and this is where it comes down to administrative controls in the sense that if a switchboard is an arc fault contained switchboard, it will contain a fault. So you can move around it whilst it's live with the doors closed and we're all okay. However, if you ever need to perform live work on that switchboard, that's where you need to do your arc flash study and know what PPE, what your boundaries are for that board. Um, because yes, as soon as you open the door, it's no longer an arc fault contained switchboard. Yep, okay. Um, and what are the typical locations to perform arc flash study in a switchboard? So I might have inadvertently answered this. Um, your worst case scenario would be where I'd start. So typically that's your incoming bus bar because that's where you've got the greatest amount of um, current carrying capacity, your biggest bus bars, your biggest space. Um, so as opposed to then doing individual calculations for every outgoing supply. So you might have a switchboard that serves four distribution boards. You wouldn't bother doing it on each of those four. Uh, you would do it on your worst case. Cool, thank you. I'm not sure if you've touched on this already, um, uh, but uh, someone has asked about your thoughts on the NENS standard. Uh, I haven't come across that one, NENS. Sorry. Oh, good. Um, and someone has asked, uh, what is the difference between an arc flash um, and an arc blast? So the blast is what people refer to with that pressure range that blasts the door open. So think of the flash as like the heat and light um, because it's hot and it's blinding. And the blast is that ionization that causes the superheated air that blows the doors out. So really, it's all part and parcel. You've got the light, you've got the heat, you've got the pressure, you've got the sound. But um, again, in confusing terms, blast, flash, both result from a fault. Thank you. And um, Benji has asked, um, is it applicable to all type of voltages? So low, medium, high voltage? Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is. And that... Um, uh, IEEE 1584, like the very first question is, is your voltage between X and Y, which is your low voltage range, or is it between um, Y and Z, which is your high voltage? And then each of those have a different set of uh, formulas that you then start calculating uh, with. Cool. Um, and thanks, Alfred, for your comment. Um, we hope you enjoy our master's program. Um, in electrical engineering. Um, Arwin has asked the Australian standard for switchboard arc flash design. Uh, so arc fault containment uh, is mentioned in AS3000 as an option. The switchboard standard uh, is your um, it might be in 61439, one of the one of the parts of AS61439, which is the new switchboard standard. But it's that switchboard test where uh, you essentially, it's a destructive test. You, you intentionally short circuit your switchboard 
you put a cloth uh, mezzanine uh, sheet a set distance away and the way that they demonstrate whether the fault was adequately contained or not is when that fault or when that explosion occurs that cloth sheet has no burn holes in it because it represents a person. Uh, so that's what the containment test looks like for those switchboards and your switchboard supplier or your manufacturer typically overseas uh, would do those tests on a typical design. Thanks Alex. Um have another question here. Uh, George has asked, do we need to perform arc flash analysis for 33 kilovolt uh, gas insulated switch gear um, and why? Well, the question of need, again, is debatable. Um, officially, we don't need to do any arc flash analysis uh, for any project or switchboard. Um, so if you've got a 33 kV switchboard, we have done 11 kV arc flush studies in-house here for our projects when we do substations. So you could still do it for 11 kV. Um, it wouldn't, again, be as onerous of a fault as your LV, but you don't have to, but you should, or you could, just to see um, what those safe boundary limits are, because I expect that switch gear would need to be maintained or just never do life work. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Um, I think we'll just do one more question. Um, this one's from Jamie. Um, he's referencing the slide uh, that uh, was representing the drop tool um, with 240 volt um, AC for single phase. Uh, would Should it be 230 volt AC in accordance with the AS3000? Yes. There is a lot of questions here, Alex. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get to all of them, um, but um, I would I would advise anyone that does have any further questions, um, please uh, drop me an email at webinars at eit.edu.au, which is on the screen there as well. Um, yeah, if you have a specific question for me or Alex. Um, but otherwise, um, thank you very much for joining us today, um, those to, uh, who are in, still in the session. Um, and thank you again, Alex, for a great presentation and being here today. No worries. Thanks, guys. Cool. Thank you. Have a good day, guys.